All right, we have just passed the bottom of the hour, which means it is time to begin. So hello and welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. If it's morning where you are joining us from, good morning. If it's tomorrow where you're joining us from, that has happened before. Uh, happy Thursday. Whatever day it is, whatever time it is, we're very thrilled to have you with us. As you can see, this webinar is being co-hosted by Green Teacher, uh, whom I am with, and Green Learning, whom my co-host Sydney Howlett is with. This is Empowering Youth Voices on Climate Change Policy. It is going to be an interactive discussion, and we're really excited about our expert panelists, J.P. Jepp, Dale Bugin, and James Harper, and a little bit more about them very shortly. I should note, this webinar will be recorded and will be posted on greenteacher.com tomorrow and will be there open source for the next 30 days. Again, just a few technical notes. We will have some discussion components for now. I'll just ask that everybody puts their microphone on mute and then we'll provide further instructions later on uh, at which times that you can turn your sound on. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The Green Teacher Main Office is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississauga peoples, and this area is covered by the Williams Treaty. You can find more information about the traditional lands and the traditional peoples of where you are at nativeland.ca. A little bit about Green Teacher. As you can see here, we enhance environmental literacy among young learners by equipping both practicing and aspiring environmental educators in all educational contexts with innovative, relevant, evidence-based resources. And our vision is for each successive generation of young learners to be more environmentally literate than the last. We began 30 years ago this month as a nonprofit quarterly magazine. We still run the quarterly magazine. We've also, over the last decade and a half, produced several books, two of which are teaching kids about climate change and teaching teens about climate change, each of which acts as a toolbox for educators to use to teach about this very important topic, which of course we will be digging into tonight on the policy side. Green Teacher last summer launched a podcast, Talking with Green Teachers. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. It includes interviews and discussions with experts in the environmental education field. A big thanks to all of our webinar partners. Uh, Green Teacher is blessed to be connected with multiple organizations that spread the word about our webinars. You can see these are our webinar partners based in Canada. We also have many webinar partners based in the United States, many of which are state affiliates of the North American Association of Environmental Education. So thank you again to all of our partners in Canada and the US. This is the second of three webinars that Green Teacher and Green Learning are co-hosting. Uh, the next one, we have a little bit of a lag time before it. It is on March 10th, and it is about STEAM-based learning, building renewable energy technologies. So hope to see you at that. I promised I would tell you more about our panelists, and I will do that. And I actually have paper notes beside me. I'm going old-fashioned style because there's lots of information. So. Uh, please indulge me as I read out the credentials of each of our panelists, just so that you can get to know them. So JP Jeff, he has experience leading climate and energy policy strategy in both the petroleum and electricity sectors and for an environmental non-government uh, organization. He was the senior advisor to the federal minister of the environment and climate change as the federal government developed the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change. He is currently the principal of Nexus Climate and Energy Solutions Consultancy, which is focused on climate change and energy transitions. Next, we have Dale Bugin. He is the vice president of research and analysis at the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, which is an independent policy research institute focused on climate change mitigation adaptation and clean growth. He previously worked as both the executive director and research director of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission as an independent consultant providing analysis and advice to governments and organizations across Canada and internationally, and as policy advisor with the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy. Continuing along, we have James Harper. He is from the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation in Treaty 8 territory, or territory, Alberta. 
He graduated from the University of Manitoba with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. He is currently pursuing a Master of Science in Renewable Energy from KTH Royal Institute of Tech and École Polytechnique. He has entrepreneurial training from ESADE Business School. Welcome, JP, Dale, and James. And my co-host is Sydney Howlett. She is with Green Learning Canada. She is a former Ontario French immersion teacher. And previous to joining Green Learning, she established new programs at a local art gallery and museum, which, and this is my favorite part, included an outdoor art education program. She is also a member of B City Kitchener Committee. So thank you to all of our panelists in advance for joining us. I am now going to unshare my screen and pass the virtual baton because everything's virtual these days. I will pass the virtual baton to my co-host from Green Learning, Sydney Howlett. Take it away, Sydney. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ian. Give me one second here while we get loaded up. So before we get into things and the questions, um, basically this is going to be a panel discussion. So we have our three panelists and I'll also um, be adding some input from Green Learning as well. I'm going to ask that while we go through, if you have questions, that you put them in the chat as we go, but we'll get to them at the end just to be conscious of time. So what are you here to learn today? So in this webinar, we hope that you're going to be able to describe Canada's current climate change policy. We hope that by the end, you're able to identify a variety of strategies, tools, and resources to empower your students. And we hope that you're able to incorporate Green Learning's Decoding Carbon program into your learning. So let's get started. So the first question is, what do you think of Canada's current climate change policy? And if it's okay, Dale, I think we'll start with you. Okay putting me on the spot, eh, Sydney? <laughs> well, well, look, I think what's most interesting about Canada's current climate change policy is that it has policy that's, that has enough teeth to actually be consistent with its ambitions. Canada has a long and kind of unfortunate history of setting targets for emissions reductions and then totally failing to implement policy that can deliver on those targets. And, and right now we have something different. We have a carbon price, like a, a, an incentive to reduce emissions, to avoid paying that carbon price across the country that's set to rise to $170 per ton by 2030. That's a really big, significant incentive uh, to reduce emissions across the economy. And there's lots of analysis that says that that's about the right order of magnitude for kind of aggressive aggressiveness of policy to deliver on our 2030 targets and set us on the path towards even deeper emissions reductions by 2050. So there's lots more pieces to that puzzle uh, and lots of more policy planks that part of that system. But to me, that's the biggest one and it's all about stringency. Awesome, that's great. And JP, I think you had something to add to that as well. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I completely agree with Dale. Uh, this is a, a fantastic uh, step forward, next step up. Uh, I call it uh, a, an energy transition plan as much as it is a climate change plan. Um, it, I agree with Dale, it does have teeth. Um, it's very comprehensive. It covers homes and buildings, transportation, uh, clean electricity, industry, uh, and carbon pricing. And carbon pricing is the piece that got uh, most of the attention since the plans rolled out. And I think it's uh, really, really important. It provides a, a view as to uh, where climate uh, pricing, sorry, carbon pricing and climate change policy is going for the next 10 years. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great plan. I agree with Dale, it's, uh, it's tra trajectory is, is going in the right direction and it's projected to deliver on our Paris commitment. Good, let's just hope we can keep up with that. What about you, James? <laughs> what do you think of Canada's current climate change policy? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So I might uh, depart a little bit from from my panelists here. Um, I do agree that uh, that our policy here in in Canada has definitely gotten like wholeheartedly improved over the recent years, and and I'm excited to see that there is indeed a very strong movement to keep going in this direction of climate action. However. Um, you know, going through 
uh, resources like Climate Action Tracker, for example, suggest that through careful analysis of the policies in place right now uh, is insufficient and will likely contribute to warming beyond three degrees. Um, so it goes to show that there is significant more work that needs to be done in our policy uh, for climate action. Um, and it needs to be done quicker. Um, and, you know, for example, like uh, transportation in Canada, we need to have had uh, the last internal combustion engine vehicle uh, to be sold by the end of the, by 2030, excuse me. Um, but there is no, there's no policy on that. Um, and we still have um, not so much uh, invested infrastructure in place for electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles or alternative fuels as aggressive as other countries. Um, so I do think that there is significant more, more um, strides that we need to take on our policy. For sure. And I think that's true for all climate change policies is that there's pros and cons to each and it's kind of what are you willing to give and take and I think Canada has done a great job but there's obviously definitely more steps to be taken. So thank you for that. And like I said, if you have any questions relating to climate change policy or anything like that, feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. So moving on here. How can we get students invested in climate change policy? I know we're all really excited about policy um, and we wanna talk about it, but how can we pass that passion on to our students and get them invested and excited about talking and making change with policy? Is there anyone who wants to get us started on this question? Well, why don't I go? Um, so I am a former teacher, so I'm getting students invested is one of the most important parts of teaching. As you know, if your students aren't engaged, they're not learning. So the first part is definitely making it relevant for students. So looking at how does climate change affect them? Climate change really comes into every single part of our lives. So it's definitely going to affect your students. It's their future that we're looking at. So really just teaching them, this is what your future is, but not in a, an aggressive or, or scary way, but just making sure that it's relevant for students and that they're taking ownership over the learning because it, it matters to them and, and it's going to, to change them. Um, so no, Dale, I noticed you had your um, mic off. Did you want to take it away again? Start yeah, I'll start. chime in, Sydney. Uh, I guess I'm, I'll make the pitch for putting the emphasis on policy here, that it's not just about climate change and not just about climate change action. And I, like, I remember when I was a kid going to, to school and getting kind of environmental education and even climate change education, the focus was so much on personal actions, on, on what individuals can do to reduce emissions, to, to contribute to solutions and, and great, fantastic. And yet also so insufficient. And in some ways, I feel like that has been a sort of red herring of sorts. If, if all the focus is on individual action, then it's easy to let emitters off the hook. The way to really drive change in this, and to really get us as a society towards solution is through policy changes. And maybe that's less sexy than, than immediate concrete actions that feel real and concrete and tangible rather than abstract and, and uh, distant and government oriented. But in terms of impact and in terms of, of translating agency from involvement of, of young people into these conversations, and these decisions, the possible ultimate impact through policy is really, really huge. And we need kind of ongoing, sustained engagement in these policy conversations. They only happen. Policy only moves forward if the voters of today and the voters of tomorrow are actively interested in, in the significance of that policy conversation. So, so it's, it's hugely important and maybe slightly underappreciated, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. JP, uh, James, I see you both nodding your head as well. Did you want to chime in there? Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah I, I would say, um, so the last federal election we had, 2019, um, it was very obvious that climate change had a very large role in, in, in that election. Um, one of the takeaways from that election was that the next election, which could be this upcoming fall or, or, or perhaps later, most folks are uh, anticipating a fall election, um, the climate change is, is going to be really, really important. So I, I completely echo and agree with Dale's uh, points that um, 
biggest mountains get moved by policy and governments hear what, uh, what their constituents, what voters want. And so if um, polling is showing that Canadians uh, are ready for, for uh, effective climate change policy and want to see Canada move on climate change, um, and it's showing that youth even more so. Uh, so I would say, yeah, that's really, really important for students to, uh, to become engaged, uh, to try to understand the policy and to let, uh, let politicians or prospective politicians know uh, that they're looking for real and effective climate change policy. Absolutely. So, James, did you wanna, did you wanna add anything? Sure, yeah, I think I just to echo some of the notes, um, even when I was in school too, it was there was a lot of talk about energy efficiency at home, uh, you know, pushing the strides between sustainable choices at home and, and convincing your parents and so forth. Um, and I definitely did that. Um, but, uh, you know, growing, growing into more of the data and the analysis, I realized that, uh, you know, that there's, there's some reports that say that the top 20 uh, companies, uh, there's, there's 20 companies responsible for a third of the world's emissions. Um, so, it, you know, there was this underpinning moment where I felt like, you know, for sure it's about walking the talk, so to speak, at home and, and your everyday actions, you have responsibility and, and students should have that vested interest, but they should also realize that it can only go so far. And there's, there's even more uh, stronger, more powerful, more emitting players out there that, that only policy can, can really change. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the th reasons why I'm invested in climate change policy. Um, and, I, and I imagine that it will resonate with students as well. Yeah, absolutely. And using the inquiry method is, is one way to kind of guide that conversation towards inquiry, whether students are looking at, you know, transportation or textiles or um, everyday recycling, there's, there's an aspect of that that can fall within policy. So just guiding students through that inquiry process and green learning does have a spiral inquiry method that can guide students through that. So that will be included in the digital handout if you're interested. Um, it's a great strategy to kind of guide that conversation back towards policy and less to that day-to-day -day life um, while still getting students really excited about policy. So thank you for sharing that. So kind of the bulk of really, what are we here for? So what strategies, resources do you have to teach high school students or any students, youth, um, about climate change policy? I know there's lots out there. Green Learning, we personally have our Decoding Carbon program, which I'll talk about in just a minute, but I want to give the panelists um, an opportunity as well if they have any resources or tools or ideas to share. Um, you're, you're welcome to share that as well. JP, see you have your mic off. <laughs> was a board member for, for Green Learning Canada? Yes, I would absolutely positively uh, recommend everybody check out Decoding Carbon. Um, the, the team at Green Learning has done a fantastic job putting together a great module there. Um, the basis of the module is, is something that I, I would uh, uh, highly get behind, and that is for, for students, for, for people going through the module, um, to think critically. Um, we're in a really funny age. We're deluged by information and some of that information has uh, very vested interest and some of it comes with spin and torque and um, there, it's, it's hard to for any individual to try to understand the, the truth behind the matter. So um, as an overall strategy, I would say try to try to get outside of your own bubble. We've got algorithms and friends uh, feeding us things. Try to try to take a look from outside uh, the bubble that we're we're kind of putting ourselves into. Uh, another would be to try to seek uh, source material rather than uh, um, material that's been filtered through others. And um, unfortunately, in order to be informed about something, it needs to be a little more active now than it maybe perhaps once was. Um, but uh, the uh, climate change policy is, is a really important topic and I would encourage others to try to do so. Awesome. And since we're kind of talking about decoding carbon, I might just get into it now and then we can kind of circle back if that's okay. So I did want sure. to give you just a brief overview of the decoding carbon program. It is a 100% free program available on the Green Learning website and those links will be available after the webinar as well for you or you can feel free to check out our website. 
Um, so the program is divided up into five different modules and the program is super flexible. So if you see something that you really like, feel free to take just that activity or just that module and incorporate it into what you're already doing in your classroom or in your learning, wherever that may be. Um, so the first module is what is climate change and how does it shape our world? So this module is really looking at what is climate change. So for example, the evolution of climate science activity has students looking, they're using the Carbon Brief um, website, and I have that in the digital handout as well. So any links or references to websites or anything that we make throughout will be available afterwards, um, but you're welcome to ask in the chat and we can throw in a link as well. Um, so basically you're using the Carbon Brief, you're looking at a virtual interactive um, history timeline of climate change, starting from, you know, before the IPCC was established to current times. So students can go through and explore the different activities that have happened, and they might be surprised to know how recent some of these, um, some of these events have, have been, you know, even within their lifetime that some of these, some of these things have happened. Then that activity goes into talking about um, what are the myths of climate change? Um, I know we've all heard them so many times, but it talks about debunking those myths. So we have a great website called Skeptical Science. So if you deal with students um, or even folks in general in your everyday life who are constantly coming back with, um, you find they're maybe giving myths about climate change, you know, it's the sun making the world too hot or, or anything like that. This is a fantastic resource and a great website that goes through myth by myth, just debunking everything using facts and figures um, that really just, it proves the, the, the science behind it. So that's the idea of that. Um, I won't go through every activity, but if there are particular activities that you're interested in, feel free to throw them in the chat and we can um, circle back. The next module is intro Introduction to Climate Change Policy. So this is where we get into what is policy, talking about negative externalities, so how our actions affect others, um, how the corporations affect, you know, people across the world. There's also this excellent game called the uh, Negative Externalities Game, which is actually in the last module, um, where students actually have the opportunity to role play, where they're the producers in the economy, and they're given scenarios, you know, between profit or sustainable um, practices, and they have to make those decisions and go through that process and see, you know, how difficult is it really and what, what steps can we take towards that. So there are a ton of great activities within the program, very interactive. Really what it does is it makes use of all the tools and, and um, digital um, interactive events and games that are available for students. And we tell you exactly how it is that you can incorporate that into your classroom using um, guided discussion questions, links, you know, we have case studies. Um, so there's just so much valuable information in this and it's all completely free, available on our website. And we do provide support with implementing this in the classroom. It can also be done completely virtually. So it has been done um, last year. We have a showcase on our website. Um, a teacher completed this entire program um, with her students while working remotely. So it's a really flexible program and really awesome them for getting students to really understand what is policy, what makes a good policy, what are the, the um, parts of a different policy, and how can that make a change and how can that make a difference in their future. And we'll talk a little bit later about how we can really get students to take action with that. But before I move on, I just want to give the um, rest of the panel a chance if you wanted to add anything else to um, sorry, to the strategies and resources that, um, that folks can use. I know Decoding Carbon is one, and I know there are lots of other um, digital tools out there. Was there any that you wanted to mention right now? Dale? I'll be self-serving, Sydney, and I'll drop yeah, the thanks. names of the two organizations that I've worked for in the, in the chat. And, and those organizations are all grounded in kind of Canada's best experts on climate change policy. Uh, it's rooted in evidence. It's absolutely nonpartisan and unbiased. Mostly we are aiming that material at, at, uh, at governments, at, at governments looking to take action on these things and, and follow advice. That means they're sometimes technical and a little hairy, but I think still useful to, to Kind of give students full credit and and get into the meat of the matter and tackle the issues at their roots. Uh, so I'll drop those those links in the chat for anyone that wants them. Awesome! Thanks so much. Yeah, and I'll just also mention. Um, I mean, I already mentioned Climate Action Tracker, a very cool and easy to understand resource on 
where nations of the world are on, on climate action and their policies uh, and a very thorough analysis of that. Um, I also want to mention the Pembina Institute, who is uh, among the great things that they do, um, are committed to uh, clean microgrid development in northern and remote communities here in Canada and getting our communities off of diesel. Um, so there's so there's some stories around that. Uh, indigenous clean energy is another great resource and indigenous climate action also a great resource uh, checking out their blogs and their articles that they post uh, regarding energy, clean energy, sustainable, uh, sustainable policies and, and uh, analysis. Awesome, those are some great resources, thank you. Okay, so moving on. So now that we've kind of talked a little bit about how to give students that knowledge about policy, what makes a good policy, where everyone in the world is at with policy, how can we empower them to actually make change with that policy? Obviously students aren't policy writers right now, so how can we really empower those students as youth to make change? Uh, James, did you want to give a, uh, to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, there's there's so many there's so many different ways that we can do it. Uh, the decoding carbon program is one of them, um, and there are some indigenous uh, related modules in there as well that that tie in indigenous empowerment and and participation in climate uh, climate policy. Um, but I also want to say that um, at least through through my education, what I was very grateful of with my educators was the ability to to think critically um, and not just about the policy announcements from from the government and, and the speeches and whatnot, um, but also about the media and media portrayal of, of certain policy announcements and and uh, you know climate related stories. Um, and one question that really stuck out to me was what what stories aren't being told um, and indeed you know, it, it really resonated with me because my community um, and, and among with the realities of many Indigenous communities um, are facing climate change uh, very, very uh, disproportionately compared to a lot of uh, the majority of Canadian society, um, yet aren't the biggest polluters whatsoever. Um, so it's, it's a little unfair and, and those are the stories that aren't really being told uh, in the media. Um, and so it, it's just it's just one of those things that I that I definitely encourage educators to to empower their students with with the with the ability to think critically, um, especially about about media. That's really well put. Thank you, Dale or JP. Did you have anything to add, Dale? Go ahead. I, I like James' answer a lot, but but I'll add one thing. I guess what's what's interesting to me, what's personally has it has engaged me on climate change policy. There's so many ways into this conversation. You can get at it through a political conversation, through an economics conversation, through a science conversation, through an engineering perspective. There are so many intersections into the climate change policy world that maybe there's lots, lots of ways into the climate change policy world for lots of different students and lots of different styles. Uh, it also makes it complicated and interesting space because there's so many different dimensions to take into account and take into and to balance. Climate change policies affect everything because emissions are embedded in everything we do and climate change impacts affect everything we do in all regions. So there's this really interesting piece that is both hyper-local and hyper-specific as well as broad and overarching and global. Uh, so maybe that's not just a downside, maybe it's also an upside. Awesome, thank you. Finish off with you, JP. Oh, sorry, JP, you're on mute. <laughs> Bound to happen once. <laughs> yeah, it's not a meeting unless somebody forgets to turn off mute, absolutely. <laughs> sorry to be the one. Um, yeah, if we're talking about how to empower students, I, I think the biggest thing is, is, is to know, first of all, that they, they have an effect. Um, yeah, right now students, uh, it's the under 25, under 30 crowd that's um, uh, having the biggest voice. The polling shows that they have um, the greatest interest moving forward and, and sadly um, the, the outcomes will have the greatest effect on, on uh, the under 30 crowd. Um, 
And so students that are in high school right now will be in a voting position within just a few short years. Um, my son's in high school and uh, he's, he's eager to be able to vote at the next uh, Alberta provincial election. Um, so with, with that, it's uh, uh, important to try. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's hard to try to be an actively informed person. It's uh, for something that's important, it's uh, passive just doesn't work anymore, unfortunately. So um, try to think critically, try to uh, see the, uh, the truth of the matter through the fog um, and then vote. Um, and more than that, don't just, don't just vote quietly. Um, if you feel strongly uh, about uh, one direction or another that provincial or federal government should, should take, um, absolutely. Uh, speak to others, uh, speak up. Um, governments hear that and governments move in that direction. Awesome. And just building off that, JP, um, students are able to write letters. They're able to tweet at government representatives. So there is no barrier right now between students and the, the folks who are making these decisions. So encourage your students to send letters, to, to tweet, to, you know, make a TikTok video about climate change policy and get the attention of those folks who are in the seat making those decisions and make sure that their voices are being heard. Um, obviously, at Green Learning, we really empower students with um, action at the end of each program. We like to call these challenges, um, but others can call them, you know, unit culminating tasks, or basically it's the moment where students put their learning and their critical thinking together to actually take action. So with the Decoding Carbon program, the, the program finalizes with the challenge, which is essentially that students are creating their own climate change policy. So we're using the Pembina um, Institute, and I'm just going to take one quick second and showcase that for you. Um, so let me know if you're having any issues seeing my screen right now. I don't see any issues. So this is the climate change policy simulator that's used in our decoding carbon challenge. So essentially once students get to know what makes a good uh, climate change policy, um, what are the pros and cons of each thing, they have the opportunity to use this simulator and put in what they believe. So you can actually go in and there are, there are guides to show you exactly how to use this and how to guide your students through using this as well. So don't be intimidated by it at all. Um, so if you're looking for example at transportation, you can decide, you know, if you want to have electric vehicle subsidies. So how much do you want to subsidize that? Every aspect of the policy can be manipulated and changed. And you can see in real time how it's going to affect things and whether or not you're going to make your goals. So this is a really interesting tool for students. Um, and there are a couple that we do list in the program if this one isn't for you, but this one is by far um, the most in-depth, I think. So students can go through looking at carbon tax by different sectors. Um, so there's a ton of learning that can happen here. And students really get the opportunity to see, you know, it's, it's not easy to make a a comprehensive climate change policy, but there are definitely improvements that can always be made and we need to constantly be striving for those things and for students to know what the goals are and what they need to do in order to, you know, reach that one point, less than 1.5% increase in global temperature, then this is where to start. So the challenge is an awesome opportunity for students to showcase really what they're able to do. And they can do that whether it's writing an actual policy. We've had students complete this challenge by creating videos. Um, so it's really showcasing it how they want to learn. Um, I do have uh, just a quick note there from a teacher who did complete the task last year. Um, she did so completely virtually. So this can, the challenge as well can be done anytime, anywhere, um, using the simulators and all of the resources in the Decoding Carbon program. And that really makes students feel empowered. They not only understand climate change policy, but they're able to talk about it critically and say, you know, well, what if we made this change? Okay, well, then we have to, to give somewhere else. So it's just another tool that students can use to really feel empowered about what they're talking about. So oh, moving on, how does climate change policy impact relations with the Indigenous peoples of Canada? I know, James, you mentioned earlier that there are so many um, folks who are left out of this conversation. So maybe if you wanted to start us off with this question and just kind of let us know what your thoughts are here. Sure thing, yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, there, I could go on for, for hours on this. Um, so so I'll, just, I'll just try to keep it brief. Um, Basically, uh, back to the first questions, actually, I just wanted to also mention that, that uh, for educators wanting to, to talk about these issues, about how climate, 
climate change affects indigenous people uh, as well as climate policy. Um, I, I highly encourage um, those to, to seek out um, any sort of guidance or relationships with their nearby nations um, and the territories that they're on. Uh, for example, here where I'm in here in Winnipeg, uh, I was able to connect to the uh, uh, Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, for example, uh, the Treaty Commission of Manitoba. Um, they don't necessarily have climate specific like resources. However, they were able to put me in touch with elders in the city, for example, who are also Zoom webinar friendly <laughs> and, and can share their stories. Um, of course, abiding by all the traditional protocols by offering medicine and so forth for their, for their time and wisdom that they share. Uh, but all in all, sharing you know, a, a sort of an, a mentor slash elder lesson on how elders have seen the land and the climate change through their own eyes and then how that has changed and affected the livelihoods of their communities. Um, you know, I, I'm still learning every single day. Every single elder I meet always has a brand new insight. For someone like me who lives and breathes climate action and climate climate policy. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that, that it, it's extremely imperative uh, and I highly encourage that, that educators to, to seek out their, their local um, guidance from the local nations and, and elders. Um, but, but for sure, climate policy, climate change policy directly impacts Indigenous peoples, no matter what it is. No matter if it seems distant or unrelated, it does. Um, and I also, uh, I also challenge um, uh, the youth and, and educators and everybody in the, in the spheres to try to figure out how and, and why. And, and again, it's that, that's, that sense of critical lens and, and so forth. Um, and you might, again, might get some really good insights from making that connection with elders uh, and community leaders as well on, on how, the, how they might be related. Yeah, and we do have in the Decoding Carbon program um, an activity called Climate Change Policy and Indigenous Relations, where using the medicine we all, as a guide, students are looking at if a solar farm or a um, oil sand infrastructure are brought into their community, how does it impact that Indigenous community in the four different ways? You know, how does it impact them spiritually? How does it impact them physically? So it's really putting those students in that mindset and thinking from a different perspective. So it's a great opportunity. Opportunity to, to do exactly what you're saying, James. Um, does anyone else want to touch on the impacts of Indigenous relations with the climate change policy? Dale, go ahead. I, I think I'll just amplify James as best I can and, and appreciate you folks for putting that into the, into the module and, and making that part of this curriculum. Uh, I've I think I'm still learning how this works too, but I've learned a lot from Indigenous colleagues at Climate Choices and Indigenous experts that I've worked with and have kind of come to realize that reconciliation with Canada's Indigenous peoples and, and climate change policy are, are not separate issues at all. They are absolutely interconnected. Uh, so just, just uh, I think the more we can amplify voices like James's the better for this conversation and for this policy progress. Absolutely. Yeah. JP, go ahead. Yeah, and I'll, 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 I'll echo. I'm, uh, actually, when, um, uh, when you first reached out to, uh, to invite to this particular panel, I was, I was thrilled to see that uh, we'd be addressing this. I, I think this is, um, and, and we, we've got a, a, a very learned panelist joining us here. Um, one of my one of the best aspects of the, the role that I had when I was in, in the federal minister's office was um, the ability to uh, be more surrounded and immersed by Indigenous topics. Um, it's something that I'm, I'm learning an awful lot about. Um, and sadly, uh, climate change, like many other topics, uh, um, brings a lot of disproportionate effect upon our Indigenous um, uh, our Indigenous citizens, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad we've, we've got great people thinking about this. Yeah, so thanks. Absolutely. 
so many um, voices that need to be brought to the table in this conversation. So as you are teaching your students and empowering your students to talk about climate policy, remember that these things aren't separate, exactly like Dale and James and JP have said, they're, they're intertwined. So definitely important. Awesome. And we are at our last question um, before we move on to the question and answer periods. Like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in there now and we'll get to them after this. So I know that this is something that um, folks deal with on sometimes a daily basis. How do you deal with climate deniers and reluctant students? JP, why don't you take it away? Sure. Uh, okay, toughy. Just <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, um, yeah, this is uh, like like many folks. This is something um, that that I do encounter. It's somebody that is is a a climate policy professional. Um, this is this is just part of part of the role and part of the job through my, through my whole career. Um, and one one uh, one set of uh, approaches that I've learned is to um, first of all not try to engage in a rather um, uh, uh, combative approach. So a lot of folks feel very strongly about climate change and climate change policy, and it's something we need to address. Um, and escalating right off the bat is definitely not the right approach. For me, what, what I've learned is to, first of all, listen, try to understand why it is that people feel the way that they feel. Um, ask why they feel the way that they, they feel about, um, about climate change uh, and try to understand why, what they're bringing to the conversation. Um, I find most often people feel very strongly about their positions. And as I said earlier, it's because they feel the way they feel because of the information that's, that's coming to them. So try to understand wh what it is, uh, why they feel the way that they feel. Um, and then look to have a conversation. Conversation helps uh, fi find an outcome. So um, then bring facts to the table. So back to the thinking critically and, and looking for the, for the truths on matter. Um, go outside your bubble, bubble seek, uh, seek um, uh, so good sources is to then bring that into the conversation. If, if the if the conversation is about how um, carbon policy is going to undermine the economy, the, well, if you've uh, taken taken some opportunity to to uh, what are the facts of the matter and bring that to the table, um, and in a in a uh, reasonable manner, then you might be able to have a good conversation. Absolutely, awesome. Thank yeah. you. James, what do you think? Do you often run into climate deniers or folks who are reluctant to, to kind of invest in climate change? Um, you know, actually, no. Oh, awesome. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, awesome. <laughs> I, yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I never really gave this much thought, um, to be honest. But I will say, I do, I do like uh, JP's answer about, about listening. Um, I think I think if if this was just thinking about it, if I was approached with with this kind of attitude, I would definitely uh, take the teaching of humility, of of trying to understand what what it really is. Um, I know that, for example, like uh, I was born in Edmonton. I there's there's that Alberta view of of you know oil and 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 economy and growth and and prosperity. Um, so people aren't necessarily, I realize there's, there's a lot of people who aren't necessarily passionate about oil. They're passionate about putting uh, food on their table and they're passionate about having a stable, resilient economy. Um, so if we, if we get to, to that, you know, commonality, uh, then there's something that we can, that we can both agree on um, and, and then try to have a dialogue on, on building that, uh, that relationship. Great, thank you. It's amazing that you don't run into this. I'm really jealous. That's awesome. What about you, Dale? What do you think? Well, I like my colleagues' answers. I mean, for, for me, I, what I do in, in my work is try to frame the language of climate change policy and the language of climate change impacts in economics terms, to speak in, in the language of prosperity, to circumvent that false dichotomy that sometimes exists. And to try to say no, it's this is this addressing this problem is all about the well-being of Canadians. It is all about the prosperity of our economy, and that's that's part of the way I think to get to JP's empathy and to to James's reframe. 
The, the other thing I'll say, and this may be terrible advice for teachers because I am not a teacher, so I don't know. So take it with a grain of salt. I'm really careful and to what extent I, I engage with some voices. Some conversations are just unconstructive and aren't worth the time for the conversations. I don't, I don't want to get into a debate with someone who is entrenched in a bubble and entrenched in ideology and is going to be absolutely unswayed by facts and evidence. That's, that's not the audience that is important to me. I'm much more interested in those that are open to a conversation that's constructive and, and grounded in facts. So maybe picking your battles is part of the story here too. For sure. Absolutely. And I know all of this kind of translate for teachers. Um, a lot of that can manifest as eco-anxiety in students. And if that's a new term for you, that's where students are just feeling really overwhelmed and anxious about, you know, the, the future that we're telling them is, is in shambles. So addressing that anxiety first um, is what I typically do with students. And I find um, whether it's stress because their parents do work in an industry that's dependent on um, fossil fuels, or they're anxious because they're worried about their future economy or they're, they're, you know, where they live, maybe that's sinking or being overrun. So addressing that anxiety, and there are lots of resources online to help with address with that. Um, so ecoanxious.ca is one where they have lots of stories and resources on how to support students through that. Um, there's also a lot of great resources online to help students identify fake news and just filter that out. There's so much, students are bombarded right now with information online and teaching them how to filter through that and pick out what's real and what's important is is really critical for this question in my opinion. Um, there's a great activity by the BBC um, which is called iReporter and it's a digital game where and it's designed for high school students where they can actually go on and they're in a simulation where they're given facts and stories and they have to filter through and figure out which ones are relevant, which ones um, are fact checked, um, all of that information. So there are definitely tons of resources and tools to help students um, filter out facts and also deal with uh, eco-anxiety. So I would highly recommend checking those out. So by my time, we have about 10 minutes left um, for questions. So I, just before that, I just wanted to highlight a couple of other resources that you are welcome to use. Obviously, um, the, green teacher or the green teacher books are great to use. Um, there are also other simulators. So the Pembina Institute has a great simulator. We also list a couple others in our resources, such as En-ROADS, which is also a great resource and very user-friendly. Um, there's also a thing called cli-fi books, which are climate science, uh, climate fiction books, essentially. Um, so this is kind of a really great opportunity for students just to get into the world, a great spark for an inquiry if you're looking to have students invested without looking at articles or um, case studies or anything like that. Movies and documentaries are also a really great way to engage students. They love watching videos and there are so many great ones out there. I've listed one here, but there, there's an, a ton. We also list a ton in our Decoding Carbon program and make use of these resources as well. Now we're on to questions. Um, so Ian, if you don't mind reading out um, a couple of the questions here for our panelists, um, that would be awesome. Will do. Uh, jump in here, uh, Xavier, thank you. And thank you everybody for sharing all the resources. We'll send all of this in a follow-up email tomorrow. So if you haven't been able to take notes, fear not. I know it's dinner time for many people. We will share all of this. So uh, Xavier asks about finding that balance between personal agency and social and political engagement, particularly when a lot of our youths aren't quite yet at the voting age. Although uh, as noted, it, they're not too far off. Uh, a few years at most in in many cases. So how do you find that that balance between personal and policy? That's an interesting one. I know Dale, you mentioned um, that you kind of pick your battles sometimes. I'm not sure if you wanted to talk to this one first. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think at, at, at Climate Choices, I think one of the things we're realizing is that we don't talk to youth enough. We, we spend ben, ben, lots, ben, ben, of lots of time, time talking to power holders and that there's some danger in that. You kind of entrench power structures and those who are incumbents to power, whether it's because of age or whether it's because of wealth or because of race and other factors. And so I think it's really important that, that we do bring youth into these policy conversations because they're they're going to be the ones affected most by the outcomes of, of these policies. And so 
trying to trying to make that connection between policy decisions today and climate impacts and outcomes years down the road is, is a hard thing to do because it's abstract, but I, still, I do think it's where the important piece is. For sure, awesome. James or JP, did you wanna jump in on that? JP, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Ian, if, could you restate the question again for me, please? Sorry about yeah, that. What, how do you find that sort of sweet spot or balance between personal agency for youths and engagement in the social and political aspect, especially given the fact that many youths aren't yet at the voting age? Sure. Um, well, I don't, I don't think they start being citizens once they turn 18. I think, uh, I think uh, sure. youth, youth have, have uh, got a huge power. Um, Greta Thunberg's still not able to vote herself. So, um, you know, of course, Greta's a, an extreme example, um, but uh, be, uh, become engaged, become informed. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, gosh, you know, I got a lot of gray here, um, but when I was in high school, um, nuclear was, was the big topic. And um, I actually started a club looking at, uh, at nuclear issues. Um, not too surprising. I went on to uh, to environmentalism and policy, but um, yeah, it's important to find a way to try to be engaged and be informed and um, and, and seek others who who are also the same, um, and then uh, try to inform yourself and try to uh, reach the decision makers. Um, I agree with Dale. I, I also don't spend a, a, an awful lot of time trying to um, change minds at the extreme ends of, of any spectrum. They're, the folks in the middle are where the conversation's at. So um, if, if youth could find a way to uh, be part of the, the, the conversation, um, I do know having been inside the minister's office that uh, ministers and, and, uh, and politicians are, are very open to, to hearing it. it Sadly, it just doesn't happen an, an awful lot. Um, but yeah, be, be, try try best to be involved. Awesome, James. Did you have anything to add? Um, I just would encourage youth to also, since since youth these days are very into social media, I understand that social media can can also be harmful in in many ways. Um, but but for the sake of, of mobilizing and organizing for movements and and just getting advocacy and, and the word out, um, social media can really be used as a powerful tool um, and, and to keep engaged and informed on, on issues. Absolutely, for sure. And I think the balance is always dependent on who you're talking with and the student. You know, what what is their history? What what do they what are they already doing? What are what are they feeling empowered to do? You never want to crush anyone's spirits if they want to go above and beyond, but just recognizing that as well and being flexible as a teacher for sure. Thank you so much for that. Ian, are there any other questions? Yeah, Ellen asks, what is the number one policy issue that youth should be engaged with? Really oh. straight and direct question. <laughs> so straight and direct, but a tough one, I'm sure. Yeah. Does anyone want to start us off? Dale, go ahead. Oh, what a hard question. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna try in two different ways. I'm gonna try a cheat answer first and then I'll try my other a, a Fair answer. Enough. Uh, for me, it, it's not any one policy lever that, that's gonna matter most or any one policy conversation. It's this more abstract idea about what we can actually expect our policies to achieve. I think that the key to the climate policy conversation is it's about outcomes. It's, it's been too easy to talk a good game around policies that don't do very much or don't have very much impact or have no cost, but also not so much in terms of benefits. So this, this grounding our policy conversations in, in what they will actually deliver, I think is the heart of the matter. In, in terms of specific things, I'll betray my economist roots and say that does take me to carbon pricing. It does take me to the big thing that can drive really significant changes, both in the short term and the long term, but also the issue that is most political, most politicized, and most full of misinformation, and so merits more attention. Awesome. JP, you look ready to go there. <laughs> Um, as usual, I, I, in, in most things, I, I, I agree with Dale, um, and uh, economists uh, 
over and over again, we'll say that uh, the most efficient way to uh, to put a uh, signal through our choices on an everyday basis is through carbon pricing. Um, completely agree with uh, Dale, and that's one of the reasons I'm very happy with uh, the climate policy that rolled out. Uh, provides that signal for for onward of ten years. Um, the number one policy issue that uh, Again, yeah, I don't think it's any single policy, climate change at a macro level, but um, right now, this decade, uh, and, and even this year, we're gonna be making some choices on where uh, we as, as, as a nation and, and individual provinces um, direct some money uh, in post-COVID post recovery. Um, and we have a bit of a, a choice right now, do we, uh, direct uh, dollars post post COVID recovery monies towards the way we used to do things, or the way that things uh, are going to be on a forward basis. So uh, this this decade, the 2020s, I think we're going to see some very profound change uh, within our energy systems, the way we way we uh, move about, the way we uh, we our houses communicate with the world, um, and uh, yeah, I th I think we need to put an awful lot of thought in towards uh, directing our economy to where the curves are, are, are going to be, to where the, you know, I, I often say, uh, you know, look at the windshield, where is the car going rather than the rearview mirror where the car was. Um, and uh, I think in 10 years from now, we'll be a lot better off if, if we start thinking in that direction. So um, youth uh, would encourage youth to, to also start thinking out the, out the windshield and, and loudly rather than looking in the, in the rearview mirror. Awesome. James, go ahead. Yeah, um, I yeah, this is this is a big question, but I but I just want to I, I every time I, I look at climate action, it all boils down basically to to reconciliation and indigenous empowerment. And it might sound like I'm I'm just a broken record and I care about one issue. Um, but the, the more closely I look at at who we are as, as Indigenous people, who I am as a Nihiao person, I realized that our livelihoods for, for time immemorial were shaped around coexisting with the earth. Um, you know, the zero waste society, now we're talking about a circular economy. This is something that, that we thrived on and lived on, um, that we survived and, and thrived for, for many millennia. Um, you know, blocking blocking the territories from from uh, from pipelines, for example. You know that directly speaking, protecting the territories for sure is is one thing, but perhaps also protecting us from from the potential uh, emissions that might come out of of the result of of greater exports of LNG is is, is another. Um, so so the more the more I think about it, the more I realize that. Perhaps, you know, because Indigenous people represent less than 5% of the world's population, but protect over 80% of the world's biodiversity, I, you know, it just, it just makes more sense on why Indigenous people should be empowered and be at the table when talking about climate action and climate policy. For sure, that's so important. Thank you, James. And definitely looking at what your students are invested in and interested in will help them um, empower them to do more as well. So if your students are really, you notice that they pick up on one particular issue within policy, you can always uh, kind of gear the, the conversation and the learning in that direction as well. Are there any other questions? I think we're just about out of time here. Yeah, just, just about wrapped up. I, I just want to kind of piggyback on that and... Um... Are, are there any competing narratives that sort of muddy the waters unnecessarily with this? I had a really interesting discussion with an educator recently who said that they, they talk with a lot of students who are, are so inspired to revolutionize everything and revolutionize the economy. And then if you get digging and reading, you see, well, we, you know, we have this short period of time as laid out by the IPCC. Is that something that's realistic? Do we have the political capital to, to completely overhaul? overhaul the economy. I mean, how would you speak to a, a, a really energetic youth who's like, you know, we, we need to totally go right back to square one with, with the economy? The experts on the economy, those youth. <laughs> Does anybody want to kick us off here? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first on that one. So um, one of the things that I'm most 
optimistic about right now and the things um yeah that, that that gives me the most sense of hope over the next number of years um i don't see the need to overhaul the economy like that that to me says that uh we're trying to bring about an outcome that wouldn't otherwise come about or that um or that just requires brute force and, and determination to to turn the ship i think uh, one of the things that gives me the most hope is that uh, right now the, the most climate friendly choices are quite often the most economic choices. So with mm -hmm. renewable energy right now, um, it is the lowest levelized cost of electricity in Canada. It's, um, uh, I encounter folks all the time that think that uh, renewable energy requires subsidies in order to, uh, in order to be uh, generating or very soon electric vehicles are going to be lower capital costs than internal combustion engines. And um, I, these sorts of things give me hope. So because uh, the technology is maturing, um, these are about to become the most economic choices. So um, yes, we, we do need to uh, bring green uh, into, into the economy in the way we uh, um, build our houses and uh, generate our electricity and other things. But uh, I get a lot of hope that that's the way things uh, are, are moving from an economic perspective. Sure. Does anyone else want to jump in on this one? James, Dale? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add, uh, I, love, I love when I'm exposed to that energy with, with youth. And this is part of the reason why I wake up every morning. Um, and, and I do do quite a bit of, of youth engagement, direct youth engagement myself, uh, exactly to harness that passion, uh, because I do not want that passion to, to go away, um, you know. And so, so when I think about it, about youth who, who have those questions about economic abilities of, of the climate uh, action policies that we have in place, for example, I always point to to where I come to as as a trained engineer, for example. Um, I'm learning that that as mentioned, the cost of of EVs and and fuel cell vehicles we're still not there. Uh, we're getting yeah. there, but we're we're not exactly there, especially to meet the needs of Canadian drivers, for example. Um, so as an engineer, I'm almost passionate and motivated enough and empowered by my educators to be like. Okay, well, how how do I do that? How do I use my training to to help that out? Help help the cost of batteries and fuel cells decrease, improve its performance, and so forth. And even not even from technical perspectives, but even from regulation perspectives, uh, trained lawyers and trained economists can advise on the costs of electricity in our in our grids, for example, um, and the and the pricing schemes involved in all of that. Um, there's a place for everybody. Um, so identifying that, that problem uh, at the beginning, harnessing it, and then recognizing where that youth wants to be, for example, uh, and what kind of role they want to play, and then, and then driving on that. Dale, did you have something to add? There's something really hard about the tension between incrementalism and transformational change. Mm. And I don't think you as educators should shy away from that tension like it is it is the the crux of things in some ways on one hand the science is screaming out for change as rapid as we can make it and on the other hand the power structures that exist and the, the institutional and political structures that exist make implementing that transformational change rapid change really really hard and really challenging and i guess i my caution is is that i don't want to throw out incrementalism entirely because that's what we've got and those are the the bounds that we have to work with in some cases and i i would hate to reject strong significant incremental starting places for our policy and for our progress uh, because it's not absolute. I think that there are lots of shades of gray here and this conversation is hard. It is hard because change is hard and the scale of change we're talking about is hard. And let's, let's not deny that, uh, but let's not make 
transformational change the only and ultimate measure, measure of success or we will never succeed. For and sure. that's certainly an argument that you see in a lot of the literature. And I, I thank our student from Conestoga College for, for voicing their concerns in the chat here. And it's absolutely true. I mean, we've seen so many vested interests who have very deliberately poured astronomical amounts of money. I mean, I, I put in the chat box about the book Merchants of Doubt, which came out a few years ago. It's a great read about a, a very deliberate attempt to sway public opinion and add doubt. And it is incredibly frustrating. And I mean, we've seen Greta Thunberg's speech about how she doesn't want, uh, I forget the exact quote, but she wants people to be as angry and afraid as she is. And that's part of the discussion. I think we're just about wrapped up, but I wanna say thank you so much, Ian, for hosting today. And thank you, James, Dale, and JP um, for your insight. I hope everyone found it useful and that you're able to take something back to your learners. If you do have any questions, um, our contact information will be shared. So feel free to get in touch with me. I'm happy to talk about the Decoding Carbon program, the challenge, or any, um, any of our programs. I encourage you to register for the Decoding Carbon Challenge. Like I said, it's completely free and you do have a chance to win um, prizes of up to $1,000. So thank you so much for, for joining um, and I'll let Ian kind of finish us off here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just added the feedback, uh, feedback survey. I, I'm having trouble with English. It's been a long day. The feedback survey, it's a Google form, only takes two or three minutes to fill out. And uh, anyone who does will be eligible for a free subscription to Green Teacher. So check it out in the chat box. It will also be up on our website tomorrow, greenteacher.com, which will also have the recording of this webinar, which will be open source for 30 days and then accessible in our archive for all subscribers. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you again. I echo uh, what Sydney said in thanking our panelists and I hope this conversation continues. Please do reach out to us if you have any additional questions. That's, that's both for Sydney and myself and our panelists. Uh, check out the resources that our various organiza organizations have. We're all nonprofits. We're not competing against each other. We're all aiming for the same goal. And uh, we all want to raise all the boats as much, much as we can. So thank you, everybody. And we will chat soon.